welcome to New Game Plus TV Live. We're live on twitch.tv slash New Game Plus TV every Thursday night around uh, 8 p.m. Uh, you might be watching us on C31 or C44 or watch, or listening to us as a podcast. Uh, my name is Jack and I'm joined by Don, Jason and Cart. We're going to be talking video games for the next little bit. Uh, Don, you have been playing uh, F1 2020. How's that been? 2020th installment of Formula One. <laughs> it's so a many good one. Of them. Oh, yeah. God. Um, At least 2019 of them. That's a lot. Um, you also wrote a review. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. Is someone going to tell him? It's not how it works. <laughs> Man, they've really had a lot of time to improve on it, though. Um, you also wrote a review. I'm pretty yes, sure you wrote review, a review. Yeah. Yeah, that review is currently available on our website at newgameplus.tv. But let's talk about some of the stuff that I didn't have time for in the review. Like, there are certain aspects I kind of want to hone in on to really dork out on so that should be coming up a little bit later on yeah. um cart you've been playing uh microsoft flight sim which is it's been a very long time since the last flight sim to my knowledge yeah so uh i mean given the previous version of the microsoft flight simulator has been um essentially on steam for a few years now there's a steam edition of it um this one is basically the soft reboot of the series so the the very um thick lore of the microsoft flight simulator series has now been rebooted because it's not technically microsoft flight simulator 2020 it is microsoft flight simulator full stop they went with the yeah. iPad approach. Love that. They go. They're going with the platform now. They're going with the platform approach to it. So it's going to be like the the ongoing platform. And I can you can see with the way they've done a bunch of stuff, they're going to just turn into a technological marvel. I think it's pretty good mm. as it is. So. And I do touch on that in my review a bit as well. So what, what yeah, do you see that they that add on to the world? Like on Forza Horizon, it's like we're going to make pretend mountains and stuff like that. But like, I feel like Flight Sim probably wouldn't do as well in that regard. You say that, but then you've got to factor in the you know, mapping the entire world with functioning airports and all that kind of silliness takes a lot of lot of uh, technology to do. That's why they've gone the uh, the kind of the the Google Mapsy. 3D model that they have, and then they've got like have you seen how many MCG? airports is it? Can be like honestly, three, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's honestly very, very different to that of uh, Forza Horizon 3, where um, Byron Bay is located right next oh to Yarra Valley. Oh my god, that map! I hate that map. It's the most cast. It's a very good game. I, I love, I love it. I love it in a different way. Like I love it and I hate it, but both for equal sides. <laughs> and um, Jason, you've been playing both Carrion and Battletoads. Which one do you want to talk about more? Yes. Um, Carrion's quicker. Um, Battletoads, I think, is more divisive. Carrion's a devolver game, so there's a certain expectation that it's good, and it's pretty good. Um, but Battletoads, I don't know, it, it, it sits in an interesting spot. It's it's not really easy enough for you to just pick up and play, but it's not gone the full nostalgia route. Like, it didn't go 2D visuals with, like, the pixelated graphics or whatever. And so people are kind of freaking out on that. But I don't know. I think I think Battletoads will probably take up most of it just because um, there's more to talk about. Cool. Um, that's all coming up later on in the show. But first, we've got the video game news headlines of the week. We're going to start off with uh, some Apple news. Uh, well, I guess more specifically, some Fortnite news. Uh, let me get that <laughs> good to go. New really mess, fight. I love live television. <laughs> uh, Apple is threatening to terminate Epic Games' access to develop for iOS, macOS, and other Apple platforms. Apple notified Epic it was terminating Epic from the Apple Developer Program, blocking all Epic products from distribution through Apple's App Store, Epic said in documents filed in the U.S. District Court in Northern California. Uh, and we're going to talk about whether or not that's actually happening in just a sec. Uh, this news comes after the Fortnite developer sued Apple for blocking its game from the App Store. Prior to the removal, Epic implemented a new way to purchase V bucks fortnite's in-game currency allowing users to bypass apple's payment system for a discount players that chose to purchase directly through epic pay less for v bucks and epic keeps the 30 percent cut that apple otherwise would take apple said the new payment system was not reviewed or approved by apple i'm gonna start off with i hate this news story i hate this news story so much because to start shit in the way that epic started shit and then turn around and be like, oh, man, we like the, the, the big guy is really having to go with the little guy. Yeah, the little guy, Epic Games. And they launched Poor little Epic. 1984. The actual $2 trillion oh, uh, valued Apple. God mm. almighty. I, I hate it's, this and thing. Yeah, and, not to mention, but, like yeah, and, the, and the fact that the, the fact that I had this all ready to go as yeah. well, like as soon as Apple pulled um, 
Fortnite from the App Store. Um, they launched an they in-game campaign yeah. Yeah. where they parodied the old Apple 1984 um, uh, commercial, except they added to it the hashtag free Fortnite campaign. Yeah, it all mm, feels very... Yeah. It feels very orchestrated and also extremely tone deaf as well. Like, oh no, the poor multi million dollar company is uh, is being oppressed. And it's like, guys, this is not the fight you want to put your dog in, you know? Like, this is this is just a bit too much. It's a bit too excessive. Plus, also, yeah. I don't really care about it because Infinity Blade was off the App Store years ago. So <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah, care yeah. anymore, man. No, that's bring that, it that, back that's Infinity old Blade. Epic. That- that's old epic that made uh, gears and stuff like that. That, mm. that was that was that kind of the generational switch. Now mm. it's the Sweeney epic, where it's like, you know, gaming's Donald Trump running his fucking mouth doing whatever the hell he wants. Mm. Ma- majority getting away with it. Yeah, no, nah, no, no bueno, no fun for anyone. Because yeah, to me it's just yeah. I I, I don't know. I, I think there's no there's no good or bad guy in this. But yeah. realistically, for uh, until this point, they've been happy to take money off uh like they've been having to make money off apple's platform they don't want to release on ios no problem they don't have to release on ios i mean this is exactly the kind of shit when people say let the free market de- decide itself this is exactly the shit they're talking about it's like we well, guys have you guys can release on pc you got all the consoles you've got um on um on uh the android, android. and stuff well, like that and they went after google as well, as well but yeah um, like, yeah. I guess so went after Google as well, but yeah. But it's yeah. still, obviously, yeah. most of the downloads, because they launched, they didn't launch on the Play Store originally. They launched on the Galaxy Store, I think, no. for Galaxy devices. The, yeah. yeah. Also, they had the option to yeah. sideload Fortnite onto Android oh, phones to bypass I think, um, the app altogether. The, the reason yeah. why they're targeting Apple as well is that it's such a it's such a binary case compared to that of Android, where that platform is Android. Yeah. It's a bit more nuanced in the sense that if someone wants to go and download and install and play Fortnite on an Android device, like they could just find an APK somewhere, bing, bang, boom, mm. you're done. Um, whereas with Apple, on the other hand, they've got a monopoly on, you know, this is their app store, their singular app store, and this is where you get all your stuff from. Um, if you want something else, stiff shit, too bad. If it's not in the app store, it's yeah. not going to be on your phone. How do you think yeah. it's going to pan out? And to me, like, yeah. I think Apple's going to just take them down. They might work out a rate later and go, cool, instead of... The, the thing with it is Apple has all the money in the world. they got all, like, they have literal cash reserves. Every other company you talk about, it'll be, are their market cap or their trading cap or any of that kind of silliness. No, 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 no. Apple just has cash, cash money. I don't care. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, they're going to lose some money on it. But realistically, they make so much off every other gacha game, of every other, like, who, you know, Cardi, I know you're on Sino Alice, and I know a bunch of people on other games. They're making money out of a fist. Like, yeah, they, they, so they'll lose a brand and alone. Make the point. So, like, just yeah. the they lost, that's so, enough. So, so, so from their point of view, it's like, cool, we lose Epic, but if we do them a deal, then all the other big gutches will turn around and say, well, hang on, if they're getting only 20% taken out, we want 20% taken out, mm. and then it starts a cascade. It's in Apple's interest to fight this to the end. It's, it's in Apple's interest to fight this right to the very yeah. end. Epic know, Epic know they'll lose this. This is a PR smear campaign. They know they'll lose it because how can you dictate that Apple has to give you access to their marketplace? You were, you can be on PC. You can be on all these other different platforms. It's not like you've been, you've been locked to a license and then they've said X, Y, Z. It's like, no, you tried to be smart. You've been slapped on it. Go fuck yourself. Like it, 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 Apple, from Apple's point of view, I, like, I hate to stick up for the multi-trillion dollar company, but they're in the right as f- as far as free market po- like economics go. They are in the right. This is their marketplace. They can do whatever the fuck they want with it. You don't want to play? Don't play. Cool, easy. See you I mean, later. That, not not to mention, that. um, the like there'll definitely be a lot of public fighting, but I don't mm. think it'll end in a victor or a loser. I think that what this what, this what happens with every single big corporate? Mm. How do you do it out there? Is that they settle out of court? under confidential terms that none of the other companies get to find out about. And we just proceed along as if we, as if it's business as usual, except maybe uh, Epic will get slightly more favorable terms in exchange for not pushing on the antitrust button as hard as they are at the moment, especially given the, the current antitrust um, proceedings that are going where, on where in I, where I Apple? EU at the moment. Were I Apple, I would turn around on that and I would like, I would push, like, again, this is the advantage of having Trump in office is that he's already made it clear that he wants Tencent gone. Epic, do you mean that company that's owned by Tencent run a public campaign that, that, that Epic at Tencent? That's all you need to do. The Chinese xenophobia in America is like mental. So all you'd have to do to counter then that. I would have to I'm acknowledge not the fact that Apple itself 
has a lot of skin in the Chinese market and, and not to mention all the phones are manufactured in China. So you know, that that is a particular Pandora's box there. Hey, but you you but again, you wouldn't even need to do it with the Apple name on it. You would just have to suddenly suddenly the Apple news feed is filled up with those stories more. This is the problem with being able to manipulate all this data. I'm not convinced Epic wins the PR battle and I'm not convinced they get better terms out of Apple. It might be a safe face situation where they'll say we've reached an agreement and the agreement will be exactly the same. But I, there's no reason for Apple to negotiate. They 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 don't have to. There's, they don't win anything by negotiating. Like they don't, Apple, they don't have to meet them. Apple are going to yeah. see this as a necessary culling as well, and they've had experience yeah. in credentials with this in the past. Um, I mean, if mm. I, I think a lot of people remember about 15 years ago, or at least I hope a lot of people remember, uh, they've got this little notch, this little tattoo on their arm there of the kill count of uh, of Adobe, mm. for example, where Adobe yeah. tried to throw their weight around, and guess what? Apple just went. Piss off, get off our systems, see you later. And then that's it. They made an example. So that's all they need to do with Epic is go, well, yeah. we don't care anymore. See you later. It's a necessary culling. Mm. And then that, that sends a message to everybody else, every single other app store, every single developer, publisher, everything. Uh, basically, does a full scar face, you know, don't fuck us. Like that's essentially yeah, yeah, what the yeah, message yeah. is going to be. If yeah, I, I, I agree. With- step down. Yeah, I agree. I, and like, like again, the Adobe example is a good one. They've got all these other platforms they can use it on, similar to Adobe, where they'll just go and start a PC monopoly like they have. I mean, if anyone needs to be called on antitrust, it's goddamn Adobe. Oh, but that's a different yeah. conversation. Oh. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, yeah. Um, sorry, cringe. I'm, I'm, I'm hijacking again. You could, you could take this to, in such a direction for like a full half hour. I mean, that's probably News Game Plus. Mm. If you're watching live or listening to the podcast, literally listen yeah, to News Game Plus. We're recording it tomorrow. Yeah. There is uh, one more thing I do want to say, touch on this story, is that like it's a shame if the status quo is maintained because. Let's face it, mm-hmm. 30, the 30% cut that Apple and all the other digital storefronts gets from every sale is way too much. It's like cannot really be justified in 2020. Mm. It's like It'd be good to see some of that get filtered to the smaller app developers, the smaller game developers, the smaller musicians, to see them get paid more for basically for propping up all these digital storefronts. Let's not even get started on, on the music industry of Spotify. But like, just, it, like yeah. if if that is the outcome out of all of this, then I'm happy for this billionaire slap fight to take place. It won't though, and that's a shame. The, the singular thing I'll give Epic is the they only take it what a twelve percent cut, eleven percent cut, or something like, like that from yeah. everything on this on the app store. It's the only thing I'll give them, and that's literally to do that, Don. That's to disrupt that market. And I absolutely agree with you that the terms are silly in 2020. Like, what Steam's the same, everything like that. But I don't think Epic wins simply because Facebook backed off. Microsoft backed off. I mean, if those two aren't willing to go in, Epic ain't going in. Like, uh, mm. like even my, like Microsoft wanted to do uh, XCloud on Thing, uh, and because it doesn't like because it's a, an extension function and doesn't have an ability to buy XCloud through the app. Um, Apple turned them down. They said no. We don't want yeah, Apple turned them down. I mean, not that we were going to be getting have XCloud it in on Australia, your Apple devices. So, I mean, it didn't, doesn't really affect us. Understood. Either way, Understood. But, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Honestly, like, would have been Yeah, I, I I agree with you, Don. Like, I, th- I think that if that's an outcome, that's great. But I just don't think this is going to be enough. I think America, as much as they love to play it up, they love their monopolies. They love it as much as Australia does. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I just don't see it happening, unfortunately. Uh, Nintendo in Nintendo news, rather. Uh, Nintendo streamed a new Indie World presentation with a bunch of new announcements around upcoming new and re-releasing games. Uh, among them were Hades, a godlike, roguelike dungeon crawler that combines the best aspects of Supergiant's critically acclaimed titles from the fast-paced action of Bastion to the rich atmosphere and depth of Transistor. Uh, Untitled Goose Game is getting two-player mode. Uh, Torchlight 3 uh, is taking place a century after the events of Torchlight 2. Uh, in sort of smaller indie games, you've got Raji and Ancient es- uh, Epic. Uh, this intense action adventure game is set in ancient India and inspired by Hindu and Balinese mythology. A young girl chosen by the gods stands against the demonic invasion of the human realm. Uh, Spirit Pharaoh and A Short Hike are also a few uh, smaller PC games. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I, I know for a fact that Short Hike was on PC, but also Spirit Pharaoh. Uh, they are going to be coming to uh, Switch, or they have already, in fact. Uh, Short Hike, Spirit Fell, mm, yeah. uh, Raji, and those are some of the games that came out on the day of the Indie World uh, showcase, I guess. Much the majority of them of- were Shadow Drops, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shadow drops, uh, lots of them. Much of this that's, may have. That's what Nintendo does are. now. Yeah, all the games media yeah. are like, oh no, we have to cover all these games. I mean, I'm like, oh yeah, life's real hard, mate. Get over it, jeez. I mean, they 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 announced Pikmin Three Deluxe just on a Twitter post like the other day, and I'm like, did I miss a Nintendo Direct or something? Or no, no, it was it was the previous one. They then yeah. they, they announced another thing. <laughs> so they Nintendo, they, they pick, what he didn't Pikmin know. 3, yeah, <laughs> he didn't know. Yeah, well, Pikmin Three Deluxe is coming out on Switch. There you go. Heard it from me. I'm not. And, I'm not lying to yeah. you. I've got an uncle at Nintendo, yeah. Yeah. and he'll tell you all about it. <laughs> um, that that was Devolver's. That was brewing in the Devolver thing. The uncle from Nintendo. Um, yeah. But um, also, yeah, no, you're right. Um, uh, two two things I want to bring up there is uh, Cardi's right. Like it's weird. I've still got no big announcements. What's coming out at Christmas? There's nothing we first genuinely party. Don't know. We still have nothing. Nope. And I'm like, there's nothing first party. First party from a lot of. Uh, publishers and i'm like when is the news going to drop e3 uh usually would be when it is we're comfortably past e3 we're getting close to gamescom and they i feel like that maybe they're holding out on a lot of dev studios being like Mm. are you going to be able to get it gold by the like all close enough to gold for us to actually announce it um Mm. i don't know i I feel like a lot of games we would have gotten obviously getting knocked back because of covid uh possibly tgs period but that's probably only relegated to the japanese market well they don't they don't don't do tgs like they'll they they, they do it they'll do a drop beforehand so maybe you're right on that front but yeah possibly i mean Um, it's anything can happen it's 2020 anything kind of goes it's prison rules as far as we're concerned even then it's only um, a few weeks away so it's it's Mm. really that that's still super duper late. It's not as late. Oh, uh, when's games coming? Is games coming usually before or after TGS? So about now, yeah. now roughly, just yeah. before. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, yeah, Gamescom is due next week. I'm pretty sure. Like they, um, it's like the Online, twenty, yeah. the weekend. Uh, yeah, the weekend of the twenty eighth is when it Link. was meant to be on, and that's when they're doing their digital event. The the only other one I want to quickly mention is it's good to see. Like, so Raji is obviously made by Indians and tells Indian mythology and all that kind of stuff. Now. I'm the most hat tippingly atheist person you'll ever meet. I mean, that's not exactly news to anyone, but like Indian mythology and Indian gods and stuff, it's sick. Like, it's real cool. So, like, I'm yeah. glad that it's them handling their myths, doing their stories. Like, it, you know, w- w- for years we've been inundated with, you know, Norse and Greek, and, and obviously they're cool stories as well. I mean, we're being inundated with Japanese stuff because we're fucking weaves, so that's fine. Um, but like, it's cool to see them, like, doing those kind of different things. Like, we had, um, I was the one from like the um the First Nations people in Canada, and they did like the the game of like the little girl oh, walking around. I remember it, but I can't I remember the remember name. Remember, I reviewed that game for New Game yeah. Plus. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at our website for that particular yeah. game. Is that just yeah. NHL? Uh, yeah, it's awful. awful. <laughs> um, but um, but no, um, but no, um, no, and so like that was that was another cool example of that. But it was still definitely like a. You know, we were starting to find our feet and that kind of thing. And, and it was mm. a, a simple platformer and it was following it from those kind of like, you know, the um, uh, limbos and that where it's mm. that side scrolling and all the story comes to you and all that. So uh, it was of its time. I think this being like a, an arcade brawler is still of its time. But again, there's so many cool like mythos things that they can call from. Like That was one of the coolest things was Asura's Wrath was the mix of like the Buddhist and the Hindu kind of re- like yeah. influences. and so, Never alone. That was it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah and yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, bringing all that together, like that's really cool. Like I think that's um, I, I, I'm I'm excited for that. But I mean, like, how could I not be excited for Bear and Breakfast? Like I think you have to review that, Jack. Like that just sounds like your kind of game. I think we need to literally. I, first of all, we've already established that is not my kind of game. Um, if anything. Mm. We, we review it together as part of the Twinking Bear casting couch as soon as lockdown's yeah, over right, yeah. um, to just sort right. of finish. Just the- wait for the just wait for the sequel, Otter and Breakfast. It's fine. Oh, <laughs> dragged to hell. Um, I mean, I also love that a short um, hike came out. Uh, I played that. Yeah. I, I bought it immediately. Since like, oh, cool, that's on Switch. Ten bucks done, and I finished it in half an hour and just walked around the island because I just it's such a lovely world to be in. Short hike. Sure you go. Uh, yeah. Also, yeah. yeah, like a couple of other things that, yeah, just a couple of quick, my, my personal takeaways from the Nintendo thing. Like, it's good to see that Hades is cross save supported yeah. so that I can take my PC save and and transport it over to the Switch. It seems like a, a really good platform for a roguelite like Hades. And of course, Untitled, Untitled Geese game is now two player, which, well, like it, like that like part of the fun of that game was showing a, sharing it around with others, watching them react to the chaos that's going on. So to be able to engage in the chaos with them seems like a great addition to that game. I'm- also, the um the uh, what's called the uh, what's called the card trick game, uh, card sharks, the next developer shark, game, uh, which is coming out from the developers of Reigns. Um, that looks really interesting. 
Mm. Cool. Um, moving on in news that I honestly probably wouldn't rather report on, but it's a slow news week, so don't at me. Um, Treyarch's next installment in the Call of Duty franchise was announced recently in the first teaser trailer for Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. The teaser is made up entirely of newsreels and historical footage, likely providing a background for the game's plot. The trailer itself is heavy on the Cold War intrigue and introduces characters to a Soviet spy codenamed Perseus. Uh, The trailer ends with the reveal of the Call of Duty colon black ops colon cold war title which is stupid but we'll get to that in a sec <laughs> and the news that it will be revealed in full on august 26th um this quick sidebar i hate tr- teaser trailers of full reveals just reveal your game you already have all the information you've already got it all there move on but i hate all the assets I'm too. my can of mountain dew ready to go oh and where's yeah. the Doritos? And my pr- yeah. promotional bag of doritos yeah, yeah. i hate yeah, that like I, I, Call of Duty I don't colon, get the double colon I don't... fuck off yeah, I don't really get the whole idea of teaser trailers. Like, it, it's very clear that you've got all the fucking multiplayer maps already developed. All the assets are there. Just like do a couple of sweeping motions of shipment or some bullshit. Like nobody cares. But yeah. also, fifty thousand like, people used to live here. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you mention like all the historical accuracy of Black Ops? So we're actually going to see the footage of the part where JFK is like shooting zombies and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, uh, I look, I, I, like, okay. So for all the shit the Call of Duty cops is. Three games that I'll defend to the hill. First one is Modern Warfare 1, um, which is still today yeah. holds up as a brilliant game. Um, and the other one is Black Ops 1 and 2. Now, Black Ops 2 is better than Black Ops 1, totally. yeah. um, but Black Ops 2 had, had one of the best it, it, bad guys in the game. And as long as you didn't go to the good boy ending, it was a, a fantastic game. And it really did touch on a lot of those. Like, you know, yeah, you've got Tucker and you've got Mason and all that. Black Ops 2 showed you that they weren't the good guys. Like, yeah, the the real ending is them being good guys and uh, Raul Menendez, like, rotting in prison. But that's, like, you got to see them, like, blow up his sister. Like, they blew up his sister. And, like, they did it because it was, like, a, a Black Ops thing they were doing to, to like, destabilize a local government. So it's, like, you get to see that they're not the, the good guys. Modern... Uh, Activision, I'm not convinced they can handle what they're trying to do with enough nuance. Like, they're trying to do the whole um, culture wars. What was it called? The, um, oh, there's a book. The guy that they have in this thing, uh, Bremajev, is like, he was the guy who was like, here's how they're going to dismantle American society. And it's basically one-to-one with what's happening in America at the moment, right? Um, disinformation, all that kind of stuff. I'm not convinced they're going to play that straight enough. Like, they are going to couch that real bad. And it's like, but these people are just misled. They, they wouldn't have done these awful things if it wasn't for the nasty Russians telling them to be racist bastards. It just wouldn't have happened. Amer- the America I know isn't like that. And if they play that shit, oh, my fucking God, I'm going to go in on it. I mean, they'll, they'll pull their is, punches, uh, yeah. dude. You know how jingoistic Mate, I, the for, good Far Cry 5. Far Cry 5. Yeah. yeah, and it's so jingoistic. I love you, daddy. Like another fucking I love you, daddy, and because that's who they're appealing to. Yeah. Like 12-year-olds whose dads won't listen to them. I mean, yeah, that's, that's their, their market. And so I'm like, it, it's so, it was such a bad ending. But the, again, if you want the real ending, uh, kill your dad. Um, uh, like, in yeah, kill Mason. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, I mean, up to dad. you. Up to you. Go, yeah, go, go full Oedipus if you want. Into. Not my business. Uh, not my business. We live in a free society. But um, Do you know, kill your dad. Um, don't, 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 don't stop the the invasion of the the, the drones, and then just watch the real ending. The real ending of Raul Menendez is fantastic, and it, it's it a tragic carries, story no matter how you look at it. But yeah, you know, it, it peters out the whole idea, the theme of carrying on the sins of the father, and it does it in such a poignant yeah. fashion. But I think, I think, yeah, modern, yeah. definitely modern Call of Duty, modern warfare, colon Black Ops, colon yeah. modern warfare. Ooh. I think, yeah, it doesn't have a job to do it. I mean, Far Cry 5 tried to do it, and the developers pulled their punches with that. And also at the same time, I think the one thing that intrigues me the most isn't about the campaign, because I know, I don't think they have the cojones to, to go f- follow through with that, but how they move forward with Warzone. Yeah, because that's the ultimate thing. Expecting, yeah. I don't think they're expecting such a success story with it compared to like what Blackout was, what was just kind of fizzled out. But Warzone has kind of stood the test of time. And it's going to be interesting to see if they keep going with that or if they carry it through to the new client. It's going to be interesting to see. That's what I find most intrigued is the multiplayer component. See, they've converted me now. I don't like campaigns <laughs> anymore, guys. Multiplayer think, it is yeah. all the time. And that's the thing, like the ultimate thing about this conversation is that we are probably giving more credence to the Call of Duty universe and the Call of Duty lore than 99% of players ever will because they are just playing yeah. multiplayer and they are just mm-hmm. playing Warzone. And I think that is the thing that um, 
mo- that uh, people will be most excited about is what is going to happen with Warzone. Will we get a standalone app or a program? Will we have to download another 250 gigabyte program in the form of Call of Duty, colon, modern, uh, uh, Black Ops, colon, uh, Cold War, <laughs> colon, whatever? Well, the physical or- edition will come shipped with a one terabyte SSD just for that. Oh god! You know how the GameCube version of Animal Crossing came shipped with a memory card? It's pretty much like that. You, you, slap, you don't actually buy of, S- of SSD. This bad boy can fit so many uncompressed webs in it. <laughs> you, you, you don't actually buy it from a video game store anymore. Like you actually have to go to the emergency department to get it extracted that deep from the colons. So, um, <laughs> like that's... I was waiting for that. <laughs> well, that was it good. Was you, I spent I spent time formulating that. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Jesus it's like wrapped in glad wrap and everything, and no, nah, never mind. I'll stop there. Just glad wrap <laughs> for you guys. Um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, one in a million shot, Doc. One in a million shot. That is uh, the gaming news of the week. Uh, stick around. We've got it more. Was? Uh, it was. There might be more, okay. um, depending on where you look, but not on this show, not this week. Don't talk to me. Don't at me. Um, we've got more video game goodness coming up in just a sec. You're back with us here on New Game Plus TV, live on Twitch. Uh, my name is Jack. I'm here with Cart, Don, and Jason. And uh, Don, you've been playing F1 2020 recently. Um, this yes, I uh, have. Is, which dev studio is this coming to us from? It's not Codemasters. It's coming from Codemasters, it is. yes. The, cool. Basically, the, the main house of speedy race car games um, nowadays. Um, so... This is obviously the 2020th entry in the series of the F1 video games. Um, obviously, in this, in the, which, which is strange considering there's only been 70 years of Formula 1 that they managed to squeeze 2020 uh, versions of this. But no, yeah, like it is, it's a sp- annualized sports franchise. So pump them out and get all the fans to buy them, which to be honest... It, that could have been the approach that they have taken, like especially towards the this point of the console generation. Like all the EA Sports um, annual franchises, their their 2020 editions really aren't going to be doing much it's because they need to prepare for the next generation. Not so with F1 2020. If this one introduces a whole bunch of quality of life improvements and new features and new modes that really kind of justify its its purchase, even for uh, long in franchise fans of the Formula One franchise. So obviously, like the biggest. Yeah. The, I was just going to say, like people buying an F one game, obviously are into F one in some capacity. They are there for the racing. They're there for the mechanics of playing a game. I'm like there that. for the rich boy soap opera. Yes, go on. Well, that's okay. So let's address that then. The narrative of an F one game for someone that hasn't played an F one game, what like, is it? It's typical, like typically, it is like you take control of a driver, you progress them through a season, you try and make them and your team the very best, like uh, like no one ever was. Like no one ever was. F one twenty introduces a new mode called My Team Mode, which allows you to not just insert yourself into one of the existing teams, but to create a brand new Formula One team to choose everything from the team name to the logo to the livery to the power unit that it uses to your second driver. And you enter as an 11th team as the driver, as a manager driver of that team. And so like it uh, really drives home this sort of the tragedy to triumph, the rags to riches narrative of uh, of a good uh, racing story of taking a team from middling, mid-team, whatever, progress, re- developing your car, improving your parts and your uh, second driver over the course of up to 10 seasons, I think it is, to be to be really fighting it with the Mercedes and the Red Bulls out there. It's not an original narrative, mind you, but gosh darn it, it works. There's a reason why sports movies haven't really changed in the past 50 years. <laughs> How much extra currency do you have to buy? How much in-game currency do you have to buy? Like, Is it like 2K where you have to just keep buying in-game well, currency? Well, there is a straight is up career mode? A- there is a battle pass in this edition that has been introduced in F1 2020, but really it is the least essential battle pass I have ever seen in a game. Sure, you get cosmetics, you get shiny new liveries for your car and your and new um, what's called decorations for your suit, but because you're basically only seeing the halo of your car in, if you're driving in uh, from the uh, standard uh, camera angle, it's pretty much useless. You're never gonna really gonna see your um your racing outfit and lot. And if you if you see if you get on the podium enough to see a celebration, go for all all power to you. But really, it seems more like it's a it was a checkbox that they had to fill. The battle pass and the in-game currency doesn't seem particularly essential. 
I was, I mean, when you were doing up your written review, which you can find at newgameplus.tv, potentially blog.newgameplus.tv, I'm not sure if that's where that goes, but something like that, um, you mentioned like there are sort of the, the usual improvements that you would expect to physics and driving. For someone that hasn't played an F1 game, but has played some of Codemasters' other games, like Dirt or Grid, um, or maybe something you know else contemporary like a, like a Forza, is it... <sighs> Does it do a good job of being accessible in the way that a lot of Codemasters other games allow it to be? But it obviously has that flexibility yes. for hardcore there are players. Plenty of sliders and um, option and like and little switches to choose from in terms of how re- how realistic simulator or how arcade you want the experience to be. So you can turn on uh, what's called um, what's called. Uh, uh, assisted braking, assisted steering, you've got your racing lines, you've got automatic manual, the standard things. But also for F1 2020, they introduce a casual racing mode where they go even easier on the racing. So, like, if you go off the track, the penalty isn't as hard. Like, it, it re- the, um, the handling really guides you around the corners. So, like, and in, com- in concert with the split screen mode, which was intro- which was brought back for F1 2020, like it, it does allow for the enfranchised F1 driver to drag along a second player who hasn't really dabbled that much in uh, Formula One before and have them race alongside. Wait, that's not the, the split screen mode, is it? That's still part that of... That is split screen. That is split yeah, screen. That's, okay. Yes. And you're playing it on PC and it still has split screen? Uh, I haven't had a chance to test it, but no, I see an option for split screen there, and I'm assuming that um, there's parity amongst all the three versions of the game on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. I mean, I guess Codemasters, I mean, more recently they had uh, one of the older games, Grid Autosport, uh, port to Switch, and so if they've got something like that running split screen, you'd bloody well hope that they can have split screen running on PC. Um, I guess what are some of the I other... Just hope that... Go on. I just hope though that they roll some of these features into F... Into the inevitable next gen version of um, the F1 game, because like as happens with every game, like every um, sports ball iteration that will be um, released next year on the PS5 and Xbox Series X, they'll be extremely stripped back. They just want to get the they just want to get the sweat technology working perfectly. They don't have any time to uh, put develop and also the ultimate team. Let's not forget about that. Mm. Oh God. They're I think um, there's ultimate team in this game in, in the game next year, aren't they? God uh, possibly. I think the next approach from a technical viewpoint is um, obviously with new generations comes new power and stuff. And I really hope that the next goal for this is 4K resolution, so that way the level of distance and the field of view is like pristine mm. at like 4K, yeah. but also not taking any dip in frame rate either. That's the goal. Is hoping. Well, and the looking- game. Absolutely. Anyway, like I didn't, I, like I had a near flawless experience um, when I was playing it on my on my decent PC, mind you. But yeah, like playing. I'm talking the- standard, like actual yeah. industry standard for consoles. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I had a question. I forgot my question was. No, looking back on Codemasters, um, what they yes. did obviously across PS3 to PS4, for example, right? Like this is a. a, a Game Dev Studio that have been putting out quality games through that period. Obviously, they had a bit of a break in the grid and I think also the Dirt releases. Obviously, they had Dirt 2 and I think Dirt Rally 2. No, Dirt Rally and then Dirt 5. Something, they had a lot of Dirt games. Um, But there was a lot of space between those games, between like when the new generation of PS4 and Xbox One came in. But for a yearly series like this, did Codemasters kind of drop the ball on PS4 and Xbox One sort of like early generation games to your memory? Um, I wasn't really acquainted with the Formula One series that early. And I think I, I picked it, I um, got back onto the series as it was picking back up. But I believe it took the standard tempo of sports annualized sports franchises and took that noticeable dip in um, feature set for um, for when the PS4 and the Xbox One were released. I mean, and so they've just been building up since then. If you don't mind as well, I actually ended up playing Formula One 2013, 2014, and 2015, around about the time where they made the switch from the um, the V12s uh, to, the, um, uh, to the hybrid engines. 
Um, basically, they took a little. They had a bit of trouble trying to emulate the difference between those old engines into the new uh, the new engines in the sense that the sense of speed was a little bit weird. So um, stuff like being able to use DRS really kind of had no effect because the cars actually felt a lot faster than they should have been. Um, so I think from a technical standpoint, they've, they're starting to really nail how it feels to be in an, in a car with a hybrid engine, but. At, at, at first, when they swapped from the V12s over to the hybrid engines, like there still was a bit of teething issues there. Um, but mm-hmm. as, I think as far as modes go, you'll notice that a lot of these kinds of yearly games like um, uh, like FIFA and wrestling and stuff like that, they'll, they'll scale back a lot of those modes at the start of each console generation. And their entire marketing campaign is how realistic it looks and how great it looks. And then eventually, as, as the years go by, they'll start to slowly bring in those features back in. So hopefully they don't do the same thing for next year, but... Fingers crossed. Uh, we, we aren't like we're going to be sticking with the current um, V6 hybrids for mm. a good while yet. Like yeah. they will, and not <clears> to mention 2021, there is there aren't going to be that much. Uh, what's called the the big purported changes that were supposed to set to take place in 2021 to the Formula One car uh, has been deferred to 2022. So it should be hopefully a smooth transition as we go from the current gen to the next. I guess wrapping up, do you think that F1 2020 delivers on that? that feature complete that you would expect at the end of a console generation? Like, is this for what it can be now pretty much the full package with the polish that it deserves? I mean, given the circumstances around COVID as well, obviously we can't have all of this stuff that was planned for the actual F1 series, but it's not now. Do you think that it still delivers everything that you would expect at the end of a console generation? And hopefully they have a good jumping off point for next year's iterations? Like natural, like I like where the series is at the moment. Like, granted, there are so many things that you could add. Like, if you really want to go deep, they could laser scan all the actually laser laser scan all the tracks. I don't think they do that. So, like, so that all the inaccuracies that are uh, that the real, real, real hardcore crowd will notice mm-hmm. aren't uh, um, like that those inaccuracies disappear. Like personally, like I wouldn't have minded if they followed the lead of F1 2019 and leaned harder into having a story mode with fictional characters like i still remember have my my bitter rivalry with uh devon butler from f1 2019 i wish they i want i I want to indulge in the full rich boy soap opera in an f1 game i mean they almost got to that point with the v8 supercar race driver series and i'm so i'm so mad that they didn't lean into that further so he's hoping they do that with the next ones yeah but uh, but what my team is a real is a is a is a good enough substitute for that and like it's compelling enough for me to keep on going even post review and but overall like the f1 series is kind of in the best place it's been for the longest time and well it's and for either whether it be for an enfranchised fan or someone who has just jo- who's been watching formula one via drive to survive it's a good time to jump in F1 2020 is available now on Windows, PS4, Xbox One, and I guess Stadia, but I mean, that doesn't really exist. We, I forgot. I literally forgot that existed. Uh, you're hanging out with us here on New Game Plus TV. Uh, back in a sec, talking more video games. You're back with us here on New Game Plus TV, live on Twitch. You might be watching us on C31 or C44 or listening to us as a podcast. My name's Jack, and I'm here with Don, Jason, and Cart. Um Car, you've been playing a little bit of Microsoft Flight Simulator. There is no year attached to this one. There is no number attached to it. Um, And I've been seeing a lot of weird crap on Twitter of like what the world looks like because apparently the entire world has been drawn up in this version of the game. So as someone who has never played Flight Sims, give me a rundown on where do we even start talking about this game? Like- where do we even start? Okay, let's let's start with with the basics. Okay, um, remember about ten years ago how we'd all scoff at um, looking at all the Steam uh, Steam games on the storefront, going, "Wow, like who would ever want to play a farming simulator? Who would ever want to play a train simulator? Like who would ever want to spend their free time by doing?" menial jobs like you know farming tending to crops or operating a truck and then fast Uh, forward 10 years later i know there's a fairly niche committed audience for those games (laughs) every game i don't have to sit here and take this my fucking rail driver controller is just off camera i don't have to sit here and take this venture to go is exact venture to go is a fun shut up loser go 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 no 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 there's Denshi Dare Go, and that's that's for the arcade casuals, and that's great. Rail Driver works on Train Sim World, where literally every single switch on the panel has an allocatable button on the front of. The- Shut up, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter, whatever. Thousand dollars on DLC, Jason. 
should be playing Steel Battalion like the rest of us chads. I anyway, wish. I wish. Oh, my, yeah. Moving on. Um, so this is the same concept can be applied to Microsoft Flight Simulator in a sense where we're like, why do we need a game like this? And suddenly with, especially even outside of the context of, um, of the coronavirus, it's come, it's come out at a, at the perfect time for it. But at the same time, um, it, it allows to go beyond that gimmick of releasing a game like this. Uh, during during a pretty trying time with some really interesting um, uses of technology as well as being a fairly competent simulator that appeals to a wide range of audiences, particularly those who, um, you know, again, it's a very niche concept, it's a very niche game, um, but it's starting to catch the eye of a lot of people who would have given this, wouldn't have given this game a second look, you know, say 10, 15 years ago. I mean, some of that comes down to obviously COVID, but a lot of it also comes down to the fact that they've, that Microsoft have mapped out the entire world. The entire world. Okay, map I'm using quite liberally there because it's very clear that parts of the world have been given more attention than others. I've seen yes. some pretty horrendous pictures of the MCG. Of, yeah. uh, I think the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are just a few of the local ones. Where have you mm. been flying around mostly, I guess? Where have I been flying around? Um, I've been too busy getting my plane stolen at the RAF base in Point Cook. No, no, just kidding. Um, so I've been flying around <laughs> a couple of places. There's a couple of places that I've been to. Obviously, a lot of the places in America are very uh, well covered in terms of like um, like Grand Canyon, for example, like mm. the, the really like clever use of bump mapping and stuff like that. It's like obviously the textures there are pristine and they have to be. Like these landmark locations have to kind of have to be. Um I find that the worst places I've found are like suburban areas and built up areas like cities, for example, mm. where you'll find the most texture, texture glitches and stuff like that. Like we're talking tunnel entrances and things like that. But I find the biggest success is definitely places that are a bit kind of a bit more out of the way um, where, where it's less populated. There's a couple of roads here and there. Um, and I find the terrain kind of really comes into its own when you find places that are a lot less populated, because trust me, you'll sit there and go like, oh, why doesn't my... I can see my house from here, but it looks like a, a, a blob in the, and, and a bunch of muddy textures down the bottom. It's like, well, you know, it all depends on how well that place has been mapped as well or when it comes to big maps. Mm. And now we know a lot of people aren't really the biggest fans of Bing maps and stuff like that. But the fact that they've managed to kind of draw this out on a scale that's not just, you know, you can explore all of America, but everywhere else, no, you don't have to. The fact that they've actually managed to kind of pull it off to some degree is great. Even the gigantic sweeping 200-story um, citadel in Faulkner in Victoria, um, they, mm-hmm. they they did a really good job emulating just how tall that thing is. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, two, two things to add to that. This is – it's hard enough to do this with train sims. Where So for train mm-hmm. sims, obviously, you're in – like a you know a corridor of thing, people can travel that corridor, take in photos, take videos, map that. You know, so it, it's hard enough to do that in train sims, right? So I can't imagine. Imagine how hard it would be to literally anywhere on the world you can access, because by the nature of this game, you should be able to access anywhere. So yeah. the way that they've managed to make those compromises, and I think this is true of. You know, this goes back to the artistic point about video games. It's about maximizing your compromises. And I think if this is the compromise, it's it's a real smart way to do it and good on them for kind of committing to the bit. Yeah. I mean, if anything, I mean, this is the, the developer that was um, behind one of my favorite games of last year, um, uh, A Plague Tale Innocence, a Sobo studio. The fact that they managed to be able to utilize these resources that Microsoft just threw at them and went make some magic, and they've managed to pull it off quite nicely. Um, you know, the, my computer doesn't catch fire when I when I when I switch it on. That they use it uses a clever amount of resources in the most like kind of minimal minimal fashion. Um, I think if anything, it's an impressive kind of proof of concept to see how other games mm. will be able to tackle this. Like if Microsoft end up um, dabbling into the the train simulator market, if they u- utilize the same assets or utilize the same technology, mm. I'd be really interested to see how they go about that. Um, but again, if anything, um, I- even if you can't really kind of see the magic of it um, and it's not exactly 120% implemented in Flight Simulator, um, the fact that they can just keep tweaking and working at this with future games or even future future releases or major patches of flight simulator down the line which i mean by all means that's going to be the case like without without any um any bones about it it is a cloud almost live servicey type of game where you have like active mm. challenges all the time and stuff mm. um the fact is that it's like this is the, this is the foundations now imagine this in about five years time if they keep working on this 
um, and keep building upon those foundations, it's just going to be really exciting and impressive to see what they can pull off. And if it's impressive now, let me tell you, in, in like five years or so, it's going to be even better. Is there a campaign? I would say, I would say one thing there. Uh, nah, Jason, go on. What were you going to say? So the only thing I would say there, and one thing that seemed actually to be really in, interesting and embracing. So um, um, the, the problem that Dovetail Games have that um, train sim world, who make train sim world, is that they've been really punitive on people who make games in engine kind of thing. So that they've not really been supportive of third party rail lines and stuff like that um, mm. to the to their detriment because they are only a small developer. Microsoft, even with its size, even with you know everything like that, like yeah, Sobo is a studio, but they've still got Microsoft heft behind them. Mm. Um, they've embraced the idea of third party people coming on and, and doing airports and, and doing routes and all this kind of stuff. So to, for, for me, I think that that community, that ongoing community um uh, it, crossover, like it, it, you know, uh, what's what I'm thinking of? Collaboration, yeah. um, yeah, support. Yeah, like, I think that that is, yeah, mm, uh, I think that is going to be a big thing for their future. Like, like you say, in a couple of years' time, I think as a platform, if they continue to build that and they continue to not be greedy about building that, I think they're in a good place. Yeah, I think also community support, particularly with uh communities for games uh, as niche as this you find that the community is maybe small um but very close knit so in that in that case i'm waiting for that one person that one aussie to start doing texture work for the boeings to do like old anset um yeah i think that's my Anset housemate honestly I, i'm pretty yeah. convinced that's gonna be my housemate because he is a tell him to get on it tell oh, him to get on such it such a fucking nerd about that shit um because <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i i i just, I just gave him my old set of Anset. the Anset um, cards he was so excited uh, yeah, he was like, yeah. oh my god you just gave him to you i'm like yeah he literally could not care so, less about this like actually for the way that the game plays though so we're, we're talking kind of more from a theoretical point of view but um i, I should actually probably talk about how the game actually oh, crazy, plays too yeah. so um so <laughs> it is a simulator. It is going to be a game that is intrinsically uh, a little bit obtuse in design. There's a lot of menus and a lot of cool things you can do. Like you, you have presets to, to communicate with air traffic controllers, telling you that you've you've butted the bread on the on the aircraft, and you've also <laughs> the technical um, term. you're requesting for takeoff and stuff like that. So it really kind of helps you kind of steal yourself for especially the role play servers that people are obviously going to troll in and be stupid. Um, but at least you're doing the right thing, and the game teaches you that. Um, there's also a fair amount of accessibility options that you can use and play around with. So if you're like a little bit da- if you feel a bit daunted at the start. Um, you know, it requires a fair amount of finesse and knowledge to uh, to really kind of um, especially take off and also land. Uh, so for people who might be a bit more casual, you know, and they forget like last minute, they forget to drop their landing gear or whatever. There's accessibility options that allow you to kind of take some of that, uh, some of that like, you know, hindsight 2020 vision kind of thinking off and then just let you kind of focus on the foundations of taking off landing and even like controlling your aircraft in midair. Um, there's also like a pretty decent tutorial, like the game kind of demands a certain amount of time from you. So if you're a person who kind of wants to dabble into this game, probably not going to be a game that you're kind of going to get your, get your, your money's worth or your time's worth out of, because there is a certain kind of, there's a certain threshold. There's a certain like difficulty curve at the start. It's quite high, but once you get past that, the sky's the limit, no pun intended. Um, so the controls are also pretty decent as well. Like if you're on a controller, it's not so bad. Um, obviously you're going to get the most out of it if you manage to get yourself a flight stick or like a, like a full yoke system with the throttles and stuff like that. Or if you, you can even tweak some of your, um, like maybe like a, like an Elgato stream deck or like a, your keyboard to kind of, kind of feel in for that, or even a steel battalion controller, if you're very lucky. Um, but I think that the standard keyboard and mouse setup, there's a certain nuance to um, to kind of u- moving, moving um, using the yaw and the yoke in kind of like a um, in kind of a in a tandem fashion, um, and a lot of that is lost even on a mechanical keyboard that accepts like multiple inputs. And plus, it's all digital inputs as well, so you can find yourself in a bit of a hurry uh, or like in a bit of a in a pickle if you are landing and suddenly mm. you're like you're landing too hard or too fast. So I think a control is pretty good, but obviously you want that yoke system or that flight stick if you're really going to commit to it. And that's that's all it comes down to. Flight Simulator is a great game, uh, but it does demand a certain amount of uh, certain amount of knowledge and a certain amount of commitment to it. And if you're not going to put in that commitment, then play Ace Combat or something because you're going to get your kicks out of that. But you know it doesn't demand that amount of um, amount of time and effort. 
that said, it is free on Game Pass, but, so that doesn't yeah. disincentivize PvE. Yeah, yeah I, like, I see. I've got my arguments against that, but on it's because it's a very niche game. But I mean, it's Microsoft; they do whatever the hell they want with their Game Pass, whatever. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give good. it a spin. Yeah, yeah, it's that's... fine if you've got Game Pass. Give it a spin. Um, you know, you're not really going to lose much from it. Use it with a controller, mm-hmm. and if you feel like that it's a game that you want to spend more time in, again, it's very calming. It's very nice. Um, then you can invest in that flight stick or whatever. You can invest in that in that yoke system, and then. I don't know, use it for a car racing game or something. I don't know. Um, but yeah. Use it, use it to what to type out your next um, Word document or in your next resume or Mac or PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, I, well, I, you want to at the very least invest in a big fancy computer because I'm not sure about um, you, Cardi, but on my st- on my modest um, PC, like I'm finding the load times to be really long and for a lot of technical hitches to pop up as well. But that might just be the nature of the scope of the game and the fact that it is streaming in a lot of the game of the game detail from yeah. the Microsoft Azure servers. But um, you're going to need a pretty decent PC to, especially to get the most out of the graphics, which are probably the most vaunted quality, the, the most praised quality of the yeah. game based it, on the general populace. I think um, I think it's just a case of, I've known there's some people who've, who've had issues with it. I'm running on a fairly powerful PC, like, we're talking 30 gig, 32 gig of memory, a decent um, graphics card and everything like that, um, which, again, is the – for the price of admission for a simulator like that, you kind of it, – it's implying you that you kind of already have fully. a system that pebble. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But I think that, um, again, the loading times, yes, I will agree with you. The loading times are a bit tough, but that's because it's loading so much stuff at once. And, and even on an SSD, I've actually got the game installed on my SSD, and it still kind of takes a little while to load. Um, particularly also when it comes to streaming all the media and stuff, because that's running off the Azure servers and, and, and all the Bing maps and stuff like that. Um, you need to make sure that you're running on a pretty decent connection, uh, as well. So if you're running on wireless, you're going to have a couple of problems. There's going to be a lot of texture pop in. Um, if you're, uh, if you're like field of view, your FOV is like kind of moved all the way back out. That's going to cause even more problems because, you know, it's trying to load in more data at a time. Um, so, but again, the game kind of lets you kind of tailor that. If you don't want to use as much satellite data, you can, you know, turn it into like a, into a low texture quality mode. So that's fine. So the game gives you those options at least. So that way you're not just stuck on the one kind of binary of you're going to have a supercomputer. Otherwise it's not going to run properly, but I find the, the, the actual in-game frame rate to be completely fine. Once everything loads in and once the pop-in stops, it's fine. Can you play offline in any capacity? I think it still does like uh, occasional server checks every now and then. Um, I haven't been, I haven't actually kind of, I've never, I haven't really kind of felt lucky enough to, to, to kind of tempt fate. It's dodgy enough it online, off. yeah. It's dodgy enough, but that's, that's the whole thing. The whole draw is the fact that it's, it's drawing data from, uh, from like Azure servers to make, uh, sorry, my cat is like making noise down the bottom. Um, the whole draw about it is like kind of making, utilizing all these like kind of mm. server technology and stuff like that. So it's kind of like you're kind of missing on the full experience if you do go go offline. But oh my god, oh, sorry, I'm just going to move my cat. No, out of that's way. fine. Um, keeps- on load as well. It's coming out on Xbox Series X, um, which. Yeah, I mean, good luck. I appreciate that the Xbox Series X obviously is specced up a fair bit better, obviously than even an Xbox One X. But to have it running on um i mean maybe it might even they they might even be able to optimize it better we're also speaking about it very quickly after release it came out only um publicly a few days ago we i believe we had a a press copy for a bit longer than that but i imagine that there will be patches and fixes and improvements and optimizations made over the course of the next few months um Mm -hmm. but do you think that you know for a game that released really a few days ago that it's in a position where you can justify or, or say to people that would be into something as niche as this, sure, go for it. I think uh, you'll find that a lot of the player user base is going to drop off um, because there's a lot of people kind of giving it a crack, especially Mm. it being on the Xbox Game Pass uh, for PC. Obviously, people are kind of dipping their toes into it. It's one of those games that you kind of really need to commit to as well. Um, It may not be as big in terms of data usage as uh call of duty modern warfare is like you know 150 gigabytes of um of uncompressed web files but it's close to that meaning that it's like you need to make sure that you've got that you've got that on your hard drive and you're probably going to be playing that every now and then when you want to calm down or kind of chill out um so i think um it depends on see like how the xbox version is going to pan out because i think that it'll it'll be kind of like a bit more of like a scaled back um, gimped version like player unknowns battleground was but that's more of kind of an optimization argument um but i think that 
stuff like the field of view is going to be cut significantly and all that sort of stuff to kind of accommodate for the specs of the Series X. Um, but I think the, the the main draw of like, you know, using the Azure servers to kind of populate the environment, I think is going to still going to be the big draw there. So I think it'll still be fine. Um, but I think that um, it all comes down to how they keep supporting the casual player base to keep them engaged. And they do a pretty good job at that in the sense that they have like, you know, weekly and like daily and, you know, monthly challenges and stuff like that, where it's like, you know, land on this extremely small airstrip. Like once you finally kind of understand how the, how the miracle of flight works, the game just goes, okay, cool, no worries. Land on this, uh, this landing strip that's like 600 feet wide or 600 feet long. And you're like, that's that's basically like trying to to break in Gran Turismo in like, you know, this line that's oh, like don't two remind me. Long. I don't want yeah, to relive that. It's basically the flight simulator equivalent of that. So it's enough to keep people engaged, um, especially some of the expert players. The expert players, they know what they're getting into. They're, they're actually already probably going through these challenges as we speak. Um, so I think, yeah, for the casual audience, I think they really need to like, keep them engaged with uh, with challenges that like that will kind of help push the envelope a little bit, but not to the point where it becomes a bit too ridiculous. Um, and again, I think also the Xbox port and re-release will will help bolster that a little bit. We'll see, we'll see how that goes. Cool. Um, so Microsoft Flight Simulator is there's no name or no no number after that. It's just Microsoft Flight Simulator is available now on PC. You can uh, download it now on Game Pass. Um, word of warning: mute the installer if you decide to install it because it's a one gig installer. I'm pretty sure Jamie or some someone else on the team had the problem where it was like a one gig installer, but it has music playing while it downloads the rest of the hundred gigs. So probably mute that if, you, if you're if you not about feeling like you're using a key gen cracker sort of software. Not that I've ever used it's one, obviously. It's pretty chill. It's a pretty chill background music as well. Yeah. So Jamie, Jamie, it's funny. Jamie gets really annoyed at like really <laughs> chill music for some reason. I don't get it, but it's still kind of funny. He was like, mute that as soon as you can. And I'm like, okay, it must be really frustrating music because again, if I'd used key gens, I imagine they'd be pretty frustrating. Um, that is a wrap on New Game Plus TV. I said we were going to do Carrion and Battletoads. I'll save that for another week. Um, you can deal with it, Jason. Um, if you are watching us on C31 or C44, we broadcast every Thursday on twitch.tv slash New Game Plus TV. Um, we are on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify. You can find the New Game Plus TV podcast and News Game Plus there as well. Uh, Jason and Dermy talk about all sorts of weird crap every week. It really baffles me. Um, <laughs> and you're on mute. Jason, you're on mute. <laughs> uh oh. No. You, you played Uh-oh. yourself, son. Yeah, now it's your turn. Uh, Jamie cuffed it last time. Now it's your turn. Um, they're calling you off the stage. Wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are on social media as well Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at New Game Plus TV. The YouTube is New Game Plus TV. You can find Jamie's most recent The Recommended there, which is actually very good fun. Um, but that's pretty much all for this week on the show. Thanks for hanging out with us, and we'll catch you next time.